Hello, everyone, everywhere. Pastor Bob Thibodeau here. Hello out there on Facebook land and, and on video. We just thank you for joining us today as we are going to talk about the current political climate, the current spiritual condition of the United States. And it's going to make a lot of you upset. <laughs> that is no lie. And what we're doing, looks like we're having some issues here with the video. Hopefully all that continues to work. But it's, I've titled today's message, You Can't Handle the Truth. And if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. And we'll begin reading about verse 24. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanliness through the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie, and worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections. Even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. Likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the woman, burning in their lust one towards another, men with men, doing that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves the recompense of their error, which was right. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind, to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to their parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who, knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but give pleasure to them that do them. Among the many distinguishing features of the Bible is that it addresses all of mankind in such a frank, straightforward manner. The scripture, <laughs> the, the Bible is the most outspoken book ever. It does not care about your political viewpoint. It does not care about political correctness. It speaks the truth which is one reason why the liberals don't like the Bible. They don't like church. They don't like God. Because if you obey and believe the Bible and the truth contained in the Bible, you can't stand for liberal policies. You cannot support liberal policies if you are a Christian. Now, wait a minute, Brother Bob. I've been a Christian all my life, and I'm a Democrat too. Well, then you're deceived in one way or the other. You know, the Bible tells it like it is. Even when it brings a bad report to man, it still says exactly what the truth is. And if we have trouble with what the Bible says, if you have trouble with what the Bible says, it's because it speaks so directly, so candidly, so bluntly, there can be no doubt at all about what the will of God is. The Bible does not pull punches at all. It never softens the hard blows of truth. Quite contrary, the Bible always speaks in a direct manner. The passage for this study that we just read is no exception. Here is portrayed the graphic reality of the world and its age-long rebellion against God. This passage brings an indictment of condemnation upon fallen mankind for its prolonged rebellion against God. God, and this is especially true in the United States of America right now. By this brutally honest charge, you can rightly assume that the Bible is indeed the written word of the living God. If we had been charged to write the book of Romans, we might have been tempted to, you know, leave out this section today, you know, from, you know, we don't want to upset people. Now, you'll hear this in a lot of churches, what, why you don't teach Bible prophecy, why you don't take a stand against abortion, why you don't take a stand against homosexual, why you don't take a stand against same-sex marriage, why you don't take a stand against this and that that goes against what the Word says. Well, we want to love people into the kingdom. 
We don't want to offend them. We'd rather have them be open to what we're saying because we accept people as they are and we just trust God and change them. Well, that sounds good. I think, I think Jesus had a phrase for it when he's talking to the Pharisees. He said, you are hypocrites. You wash the outside of the platter, but you don't take care of the things that really defile you. You are like whitewashed graves, pretty on the outside, but inside are full of dead men's bones. You know, if we had been, we may have felt it too negative to win over an audience if we were going to preach or if, we, if it was up to us to write what Paul did here in the book of Romans. Yeah, we've been under political pressure not to publish that. It, it's too negative there, Brother Bob. You can't be writing this stuff today. Why are you even preaching about this today? You're going to turn people off. They're going to click off your program right now. That's not between me and them. That's between them and God. But even if we did include these verses, we would have hidden them at the end of the letter, right? Where it would been, it probably wouldn't have been read by most people because, you know, they, they tend to, to skip over the parts they don't like. But not the Apostle Paul. The Holy Spirit was leading him to put this right here, right up front in chapter number one. He intentionally positioned these verses at the very beginning of his letter. For everyone to read, front and center, God's abandonment of the human race because of its rejection of him. Now think about that. No one could read this book without being immediately confronted with the radical corruption of the human race. Even more sobering than that is the unbelieving world's abandonment of God. You know, the shocking reality is that God has forsaken those who repeatedly forsaken him. There's nothing, in my opinion, more terrifying than what we see explained to us right here. When a person is turned over to God, by God, to his sins, he's reached the point of no return. And I say that, now let's expand it to a nation. Nation I, you know, after nation, after nation, after, including the nation of Israel, was turned over to their enemies because they rejected God and turned against his word. Throughout human history, nation after nation, England, you know, the phrase was at one time, the sun never set on the British Empire. They were all over the world. They were leading the, the leading authority in the world. They, they sent the gospel out to many nations. But when they turned against God as a nation, God turned against them, and their decline was rapid. Folks, when you reject God and everything you say and do, God has no other choice but to reject you. He can't lift you up. He can't promote you. He can't protect you when you don't do what he says. You know, that's the only explanation for the moral collapse that we see right now in the world around us. You know, this new paragraph starts with the word therefore in verse 24. You know, I always, you know, that points back to what preceded, what Paul said previously, right? I always say, if when you're reading the Bible, if you see the word therefore, back up a little bit and see what it's there for. Amen. Because it's a bridge that connects what he previously said, which would be back about verse 18 down to verse 23, with what he will now say in verses 24 to 32. This important word leads to the necessary conclusion based upon what he just asserted. Therefore, is a way to advance his argument even further. In order to understand Paul's unfolding logic, you have to remind yourself that what he wrote in the previous verses, in which he describes mankind's intentional rejection of God, the knowledge of God, the word of God, 
in, in the preceding paragraphs, Paul declared that the human race has committed the most flagrant crime. They have rejected the knowledge of God and have an ungrateful heart for the blessings he had bestowed upon them. When anyone refuses to acknowledge the truth about God, that person has chosen a path that's taken them further and further away from God. Such hardened belief, I should say hardened unbelief, places a person on a dramatic departure, drifting farther and farther away from God's influence, God's protection. It's like a boat that someone tied at the dock, but it wasn't tied securely. And as the tide changes, suddenly that rope loosens and the boat starts drifting away from the dock. If someone was in the boat and they immediately took action and started you know, rowing just a little bit, they could get back to the dock when they realized they were drifting away. But the longer the person in the boat is asleep, just kind of kick back, taking it easy, not really paying any attention. They get further and further away. Soon they get caught up in the midst of the tide and it accelerates and takes them even farther away from where the dock was. Just like that, these God rejectors, those that reject the word of God, the authority of God, the teachings of God, the word of God, the truth of God, they're drifting away from the knowledge of God. It's taking them further and further away from him. Now, what do we learn from that? We learn that no person is ever stationary. No person is static in their relationship with God. Yeah, yeah, I was born again, you know, 27 years ago. I know I'm saved. I know I'm going to heaven. But I'm not living for God, no. I don't go to church, no. I don't read the word, no. I don't watch Christian TV, no. But I know I'm born again, glory to God. As they take a slug from their whiskey. This is coffee, by the way. Everyone is either drawing closer to God or drifting further away from God. No one is static. No one is standing still. No one is in the presence of God and ignoring God. No one can ignore God in the presence of God. So you have to draw into his presence to be near him. And in order to draw into his presence, you have to acknowledge him. By this account, those who reject God obviously are drifting further away, away into the darkness of sin. At a point that is really only known to God, this rejection of him leads to, we'll just call it divine abandonment. Paul writes, God gave them over in their lust, in the lust of their hearts, to impurity. In verse 24, that is a severe judgment issued by God in which he delivers them over to deeper sin. There are some Bible commentators that presume this means that God merely allows sinful man to go his own way. While initially that may be true, that's not the way it ends up. That's not what this verse says. To the contrary, the pronouncement that we read here is far, far more severe than that. This is a judicial judgment. God is the one who takes the active role in this severe judgment. This is not God merely observing and wishing man would come, not observing the sin and, and you know, permitting men to go their own way and wishing that they would come back. No. It's not God simply letting go of the rope and allowing the current of sin to take this individual away from him. No. Picture this. Instead, it's God who's shoving the boat away from the dock. It's God shoving this person's life into the stream of sin. This is God saying, 
you don't want to be near me. You don't want anything else to do with me. I'm tired of dealing with you. Go. You see this, you know, a lot of family situations, you'll see this where the, the child is in constant rebellion, disobeying the parents, arguing with them all the time, where the parents finally say, look, we can't deal with this anymore. Go. Get out. You're not living here anymore. Oh, that's so harsh. For the liberals, it probably is. I mean, a parent loves their child. Don't get me wrong. And even when the child does wrong, they still love the child. But there comes a point in time when you just have to say, you're on your own. Come back when you get your head right. Because I'll be here. I'll always love you. But for right now, that's the lifestyle you want to live. I'm not going to condone it. I'm not going to allow it in my house. I'll let you go. It's hard. And this is what God has done, basically. God said, you want to go away from me? You don't want to listen to me? You don't want anything to do with me? I'm going to give you a shove in the direction that you want to go. I'm going to send you away from me. And there comes a point in time with a nation that rejects God that the same exact thing happens. A scripture-defying church or a gospel-refusing individual, they're all the same. God will give them a shove in the direction they want to go. This abandonment by God turns them over to the devastating lifestyle, the devastating judgment of becoming yet further engrossed in their sin. And that quote is, God gave them over. That verb, gave them over, means to be handed over to judgment. There's a Greek word. My Greek's not all up to, you know, I'm not a fluent in Greek, but the word, if I pronounce it correctly, is paradidami. It means be handed over to judgment. This same word is used elsewhere in Romans to describe when Jesus was delivered over by God for judgment, his judgment for our sins. Paul writes that Jesus was delivered over because of our transgressions, Romans 4.25. This verse describes him being given over to the judgment of God on the cross where he bore our, the payment for our sins, the penalty for our sins. We see this word used the same way in Romans 8.32 where Paul writes, he who did not spare his own son but delivered him over. Jesus was delivered over to the most painful, disgraceful, dishonoring, stringent judgment imaginable for our sins on the cross. He suffered the full force of the holy wrath of God as he died in the place of sinners, and God pushed him away. That's why Jesus, when God gave that push, Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why did you abandon me? Think about it. He was abandoned by God on that cross. And it's a hell. It was so horrible that it forced Jesus to cry out. But you know what? There are souls in hell that are experiencing the same torment. Total abandonment of God. Those souls that while they were alive on this earth, refused anything to do with God. They know what that was like. They know what Jesus, why that, that, cry by Jesus on that cross was made. Jesus, who is God, was God, is God, with God, always has been, received that push into pure sin. Think about that. That's what he experienced. This is precisely the same verb 
that Paul uses in Romans 1 24 when he writes, therefore God gave them over. Those who repeatedly reject God are in danger of being sentenced to a similar judgment that Jesus endured because their sins will not be forgiven. They will endure total abandonment by God. They are perilously close to suffering divine abandonment because they have abandoned God first. God doesn't reject anyone that comes to him through Christ. But you have to you have to come. You have to come to him. It's soul threatening and possibly soul damning for any person to reject the knowledge of God. Everyone's held accountable by God for the truth that's being revealed to them. If you're listening to me today and this does not tug at your heart, you say, ah, just shut up. Turn it off, Myrtle. This could be applied to you. When a person, when a nation defiantly rejects the knowledge of God, they find themselves given over to divine judgment. That's the only alternative. Like the boat in the example, tied up to the dock. You're tied to God. You untie it and start drifting away. If you don't actively call out, hey, get me back to the dock. Or make the effort to get back to the dock. There comes a point in time where God says, off you go. You want to be on your own? You're on your own. I'm not going to be there to protect you. Not going to be there to provide for you. That is where this nation is at right now. We are on the verge of that push. And if it were not for Donald Trump right now, God's grace and mercy divinely intervening in the 2016 election to give this nation a chance to come back to him. And those who oppose God, who oppose anything to do with God, those who want this nation to be a nation of lawlessness. That's divine judgment about to be poured out. Paul here in this scripture is so emphatic about this divine abandonment of persistent sinners that he repeats those same words, God gave them over three times in five verses. After saying God gave them over in verse 24, Paul says a second time, for this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions in verse 26. Then he writes a third time, just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over in verse 28. In rapid fire succession, we see the sobering truth reinforced three separate times. It's impossible to miss the devastating force of this threefold pronouncement of divine judgment. You know, some people make a, a point of it when Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say, and he can say, if he had to repeat himself twice, this is something you need to pay attention to. God saying it three times. But yet, so called Christians in this nation want to overlook that because of political incorrectness. Basically, it's sending a diluting influence on the nation, on the people that do that. It's a, a, a diluting spirit that influences these people and the nation. This severe abandonment of God by unrepentant sinners is not an isolated truth that is only taught in this one passage. Paul describes the same judgment in 2 Thessalonians 2.11, for this reason, God will send them a deluding influence so they will believe what is false. They'll believe a lie. Who is sending that influence? Who is causing someone to believe the lie? Think about this now. I know some of you answered the question, all right, oh, the devil. Like Flip Wilson, the devil made me buy this dress. Who's sending the deluding spirit? Who's causing someone to believe a lie? Is it Satan? Are these demons using this unbelief? The fact is, 
this deluding influence is being sent by none other than God himself. In this case, the knowledge of God that a person has received becomes deluded. The word deluding means a working of error, a straying to a wrong opinion, to be led into error. God will send a deceiving influence so that those who repeatedly reject the truth think the truth they know is right, but in effect, it's wrong. They've accepted that, that deceiving spirit, that deluding influence to lead them in the wrong direction. And they believe that is the truth. Basically, they're being forsaken by God. That's the way you want to go. I'm having nothing to do with you. And they're like, yeah, finally I'm free. Being forsaken by God, these unbelievers plunge into even deeper levels of unbelief. And this causes them to believe a damning lie. Paul explains why God gives them over, though. In order, in the Second Thessalonians 1.12, in order that they may be judged. That's tough. That's deep right there. Being turned over to their sin is the judgment of God. Why does God judge them? I thought Jesus paid the price. It's because when they heard the truth, they did not believe the truth. When the truth about God was presented to them, they rejected it. Outwardly, publicly rejected it because they turned away from the knowledge of God. He gave them a shove in the direction they chose to go. God sent this this hardening influence that causes them to believe the lies of the devil. This is not against their will. It's consistent with their will. Jesus said it this way, whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Matthew 13, 12. In other words, if a person does not act upon the truth when it's made known to them, then they're in danger of losing what they have. Elsewhere, he said, take care how you listen. Whoever does not have, even what he thinks he has, should be taken away from him, Luke 8, 18. What truth he has will be taken away from him if he does not respond to the truth he has by faith. We, th we see this happening right now in the inner cities with all the riots and the looting and the shootings and the liberal mayors and city councils and other elected officials who do nothing to condemn the violence. Their silence actually encourages more of this outrage. This is the deluding spirits that are at work in America right now, and nobody in these cities is speaking out against it. Taking pleasure in wickedness. You know, in Romans, we discover that those... You know, that, These who did not believe the truth took pleasure in wickedness, verse 24. When a person does not believe the truth, they will pursue the opposite of truth, which is sin. They love the sin. Because they rejected the light, God will cause them to delight in the darkness. Their refusal of the truth causes them to live for more wickedness. There's no neutral ground here, folks. There's no middle position concerning the knowledge of God. If a person rejects the light, Jesus said he is the light. You're rejecting Jesus. If you reject the light, then he allows you to go over into the darkness on a deeper level. Because, he, because this person refuses the light, God will, put it, will push him even further into the blackness of lawlessness. And you see that happening right now on the evening news. These so-called protesters, who are actually criminals, openly operating openly under the guise of a protest, these criminals, these protesters are taking advantage of the situation. Their leaders are hardened criminals, activists, Marxists, who want nothing more than to see the destruction of the United States, the destruction of our government, the, the destruction of the freedoms that we've enjoyed for almost 250 years, the destruction of the free market system, the destruction of, of 
opportunity for advancement for everyone. They want to institute a socialism system, a socialist system in this country that has never succeeded in any nation where it's ever been tried, ever. It's never worked. But yet they believe, oh, this time will be different. Deluding spirits who take pleasure in wickedness. We see this same truth in the opening chapter of Proverbs with the teaching of Solomon. When wisdom calls out to those passing by, countless individuals foolishly reject its appeal. But then when calamity comes, then they call out to wisdom. But there's going to come a point in time when wisdom will refuse to answer their call. Instead, wisdom rebukes these people. In Proverbs 1, 24 to 31, it says, because I called to you and you refused. I stretched out my hand. No one paid attention. You neglected all my counsel, but didn't want my reproof. So now I will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your dread comes. When your dread comes like a storm and your calamity comes like a whirlwind, when distress and anguish comes upon you, then they'll call on me, but I'm not going to answer. They will seek me diligently, but won't be able to find me because they hated my knowledge and did not choose to fear the Lord. They would not accept my counsel. They spurred all my reproofs. So now they shall eat the fruit of their own way and be satiated with their own devices. Folks, that's a terrible point to be. This stresses the critical nature of answering wisdom whenever it calls to us. You must answer. We must immediately embrace God's wisdom. If a person deliberately denies divine wisdom, God has no choice but to turn them over to darker sins, their own will, their own way. Such a person it's almost impossible for them to ever see the light again. When it occurs with a nation, that nation is ready to be turned over to the complete evil that it wants. And the United States is almost there. Deluding spirits who take pleasure in wickedness, refusing the call of wisdom to repent. Now, having announced this abandonment, Paul advances his argument even further. He states that God gave them over in their lust of their heart to impurity. This lust that grips their heart is a strong craving for sin that God forbids. This longing for evil refers to the vile passions that have been bound up in their depraved hearts. The prophet writes, the heart is deceitful above all else and desperately wicked. Who can understand it? It's Jeremiah 17, 9. This means that the unconverted heart is sinful beyond any human comprehension. It's far more wicked than any man's imagination can even conjure up. When Paul says that God abandoned them in the lust of their hearts to impurity, he means that they are descending downward from bad to worse. The strong desire of lust leads to sensual acts of impurity. They keep plunging lower and lower to a deeper involvement in wickedness and sin. Such a person finds himself with both feet basically on a slippery slope of immorality. It's a rapid plummet downward to baser forms of impurity. When God gives them over, he sends them into yet baser sins of defilement. This impurity speaks of various kinds of immorality. Paul uses it elsewhere, for God has not called us for the purpose of impurity, but to sanctification, 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 4, 7. Here, impurity refers to sexual immorality in verse 3. This word impurity is also found in Galatians 5, 19. It says, now the deeds of the flesh are evident, immorality, impurity, sensuality, and many other sins there. In this verse, immorality is a Big catch-all phrase that includes every category of deviant sexual behavior outside of marriage. 
It encompasses every sexual perversion that is outside of the husband and wife relationship. It covers every filthy sexual act from pornography to adultery, bestiality to, to pedophilia. Some deeds just too improper to even mention. When a person rejects God, find themselves on a course that spirals downward continuously, leading to sensuality, which is wanton, fleshly, sinful desires. Paul specifies the result so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. To be dishonored describes all kinds of shameful sexual acts committed in, to, and with their bodies. Paul is designating sexual sin as being in a special category of sin all by itself. And yet, that's where the United States is today. These liberal politicians, they not only participate, condone, they influence and push this on people. You know, you have these transvestites all dressed up in costumes, reading books to kindergarten children, but yet someone can't come in and read the Bible to them. It is a self-inflicted destruction that does more damage to a person's own body. He stayed, Paul states elsewhere, every sin that a man commits is outside of the body but the immoral man sins against his own body. He says that sexual sin is the most unique in its character. It rises from within the body and is driven by pers personal gratification. It affects the body like no other sin. Describing sexual activity outside of marriage, the Bible asks, can a man take fire into his bosom and not be burned? It's Proverbs 6.27. This question is rhetorical anticipate an obvious negative answer, right? The one who commits sexual sin is playing with a consuming fire. All sexual sin is a self-damaging sin and destroys a person like no other sin can do, spirit, soul, and body. And any society that rejects God, rejects God's truth, and it will find itself devolving downward into deeper and deeper basal sins and we see that once they kicked god out of school once they took the ten commandments down said you couldn't pray in school us anymore what was the very next thing to happen the sexual revolution of the 60s which led to more unwanted pregnancies which passed the abortion laws and onward the spiral continues to this day this is an obvious clue as to where this nation is headed no culture that refuses the, this divine standard is evolving upward to a higher level of morality. No, every society that embraces this culture is descending into the cesspool of sin and iniquity. And when leaders allow, encourage, and enforce sexual immorality as being, quote unquote, normal or acceptable, then God has no choice but to push them away and allow them to continue down that path towards their own destruction. And a nation who does that finds themselves in the same boat. Those who reject the knowledge of God find themselves wallowing in lower forms of immorality and filth. Whenever any society or nation rejects the knowledge of God, it descends into unrestrained sexual immorality. And that's what we see also in this nation right now. Whenever a religious group or church denomination chooses a course that rejects the clear teaching of God's word, it will eventually tolerate and then endorse immorality as well. This ends up being reflected in the lifestyle of their own pastors and membership. That group will be like, be like a dump truck barreling down this hill with no brakes. The runaway truck just continues to pick up speed as it plummets down the hill, running over anybody in its path until finally it crashes at the bottom where it empties its trash on those who dwell there. That's the way it is with people who reject the truth of God. They will be abandoned by God and given over to lower and lower forms of immoral filth. Now, Paul continues to build his case here. When he says, for this reason, God gave them over to their degrading passions. These passions are, 
are degrading, meaning they are disgraceful, dishonoring, shameful, viral, depraved. It describes a fomenting lust in a person's flesh. What do these evil passions produce? Paul begins his argument here with the women. For their women exchange the natural function for that which is unnatural. And remember, all this went back to the 1960s when they outlawed God from being in public. I can remember saying, you know, the first thing you do is you pledge, say, you pledge to allegiance, and then the teacher would lead a quick prayer. She might read a scripture from the Bible. But then that was taken out. The Ten Commandments were taken off the board. Prayer was outlawed in school. And like I said, then the sexual revolution started, and that's what we see. And that progressed to the point where the women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural. Because after the sexual revolution, after the abortions, well, maybe we can have sex without getting pregnant. One way of doing that is homosexuality. Paul continues to trace that downward spiral to, to deeper, grosser sexual sins and adds, in the same way also, the men abandon the natural function of the woman and burn their desire one towards another. Men with men committing indecent acts and receiving their own in their own persons their due penalty of the air in verse 27. Remember when AIDS started? How was it mainly transmitted in the homosexual community? Men with men. But instead of changing the wicked ways, they came up ways to go even deeper in sin. Regarding the male gender, the natural function is for a man to marry a woman, have a sexual relationship with her, and the result of this union produces children, offspring. But those who have been abandoned by God, it's because they've abandoned the natural attraction for the opposite sex. They have strange sexual desires for other men, women with other women. This divine desertion occurs all because they rejected God. Now think about this. I want you to think about this. Which type of church do people with these sexual perversions usually attend? It's usually a church who's accepting to their immoral lifestyle. The pastors will probably be involved in that immoral lifestyle. I'm not judging any person. I'm judging the sin. I'm not saying that you should shut people out of your church if they are homosexuals or you know, drug addicts or whatever the case may be. No. You need to accept them. You accept them, but you make a point. We're not accepting the sin, and we will be preaching about these sins with the hope that God's truth be revealed to them and their heart would change. It is possible for homosexuals to become heterosexuals. It is possible for that to happen, testimony after testimony. When they hear the truth of God's word, God's word gets down into their heart, takes root, grows, and a change of life happens. Folks, the death of sin only happens through Jesus Christ. That's the only place it can happen. And if someone rejects the truth, they reject Jesus, which means sin is still alive. And you can say it's not all you want, but it's still there if you reject Jesus. How can any mainline denomination ordained to ministry those who openly live in homosexual sin? Again, the answer is simple. They just reject the authority of the Bible. They reject the virgin birth. They reject the deity of Christ. They've done it long ago. That's how they got to this point. They rejected the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. They reject the exclusivity of salvation in Christ alone. 
Those were the greater sins of unbelief. This is where those sins lead a denomination. The inevitable result of rejecting the inspiration of Scripture is just God giving them over to judgment. That judgment may not be immediate. The sins of a nation that refuses to repent, that refuses to, to turn back to God, that judgment may not be immediate, but it is coming. The only hope is if the people in the boat make a conscious decision, we're going to turn around, we're going to do all we can to paddle even with our own hands till we get back to God, get back to that dock. Because I don't like the way we're going. That's the only hope they can have. There is no politically correct spin to put on this gross sin. This strong teaching against sin is diametrically opposed to where we, sadly, are today. What Paul teaches could not be any further away from today's popular teachings, especially in mainline liberal churches. This teaching by Paul is a long way from, oh, smile, God loves you. He's got a wonderful plan for your life. Deluding spirits who take pleasure in wickedness, refusing the call of wisdom to repent, but instead embrace, promote, and participate in sexual immorality in a, as a lifestyle that says, we don't need God in our life anymore. Next, Paul clarifies why God is opposed to such sinners. He writes, for they exchange the truth of God for a lie. That is, at one time they knew the truth of God, it was made known to them, but they cast it aside. Instead, they believed a lie. Therefore, they worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. This restates what Paul wrote earlier. They exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. How could anyone end up in such a degrading place? It's simple. They rejected the knowledge of God when it was made known to them. They find themselves groping in greater darkness, grasping for anything to worship. Blind leading the blind, Jesus said. Many, many worship man-made idols. Others worship their own body. Still others worship their possessions. And even others worship their career above everything else. But they mainly worship some, something or someone other than God. So what's an idol? Well, maybe the form of a false deity that's cut out of wood or stone. But an idol can be anything that a person loves more than God. It's anything that anyone respects, fears, desires more than God. It's anything that anyone serves more than God. An idol is anything that some person prizes and pursues and considers more important than God. Think about politicians. They often will compromise what they claim to be their principles in an effort to hold on to their political power. The Bible says, little children, guard yourselves from the idols. Early, the apostle wrote, do not love the world nor the things of the world. An idol is anything in the world that a person loves more than God. Now, everyone worships something. When people reject the knowledge of God, they are going to give their affections and their allegiance to something or someone else. Whatever that something is, it becomes an idol in their life, whether crafted with hands or conceived by their own minds. Whatever a person worships, they will serve wholeheartedly. Whatever a person worships, he will give it his time and resources. When a person is preoccupied, whatever that is with, determines what it is he's going to serve. Such misplaced affections cause an individual to serve the creature rather than the creator. You know, prior to this pandemic shutdown, the United States worshiped sports idols, music idols, Hollywood idols, career idols, money idols. I've said it before. I believe God allowed this pandemic to strike and shut everything down, keeping people locked up in their homes for several months for one reason, to allow each individual person to think about what is important to them without the distractions of idol worship because he shut down sporting events without uh, distraction of music idol worship because he shut down all the concert venues without the distraction of Hollywood idol worship because they shut down all the movie theaters and making movies and all that without 
the distraction of having to go to work for a living, as tough as that is, you quickly realize that you are worshiping that money. But instead, allowing you to determine what is truly in your heart, family, country, God, all those things. Well, why did shut down? Why did God allow the churches to shut down then, Brother Bob? Simple. Too many people were putting their trust in the church and in their pastor for their salvation. The church is not the building. The church is you. As we said in our prayer to begin, the church is the body of Christ. And that is made up of individuals. You do not need to go to church to be saved. You don't need to go to church to get born again. You don't need the church to tell you right from wrong or to read your Bible for you. That's one of the problems in churches today. They put it up on the board so nobody brings their Bible to church anymore. The church is a local gathering of like-minded believers who want to make a collective impact on their community. But if you are going to trust your church for getting you to heaven, you're going to be sorely disappointed. You're listening to those deluding spirits again. Deluding spirits who take pleasure in wickedness, refusing the call of wisdom to repent, but instead embrace, promote, and participate in sexual immorality as a lifestyle that says they don't need God. And then they lift up other things as idols they worship rather than worshiping God, including their church and their pastors. We see this happening in the inner cities today. Just a few years ago, in 2015, when the Baltimore riots were spreading to other cities, you would see pastors come together and stand in between the police and the protesters and pray. They'd be on television and on the news explaining we need to come together and pray. You don't see that today. That leadership is lacking today. Why? Because what we've known all along, these inner city pastors have, been, have sold their souls to the devil in exchange for prominence and paybacks and kickbacks and bribes from corrupt politicians in the land, these political spirits, but get your people to vote for me. So this question is not, why is God allowing this to happen? Instead, the question that needs to be asked is, why did it take God so long to push us away and allow this to happen? As I said, your salvation is your decision alone. Nobody else's. Not your parents, not your aunt, not your pastor, not your politician. It's between you and God. How can you know? Read your Bible. Everything I talked about today is right here in the Bible. The truth. But in this nation right now, to quote that famous line from A Few Good Men when Jack Nicholson angrily, angrily shouted, you can't handle the truth. Now, unfortunately, that is the position we find ourselves in today in the United States of America. Spiritually, this nation cannot handle the truth. It will take individual Christians to take their stand for the word of God regardless of what the political consequence is going to be, regardless of the backlash. God is looking for people who trust him. How about you? Can God count on you? Can God trust you? The only answer to that is do you trust God? If you've never received Jesus as your Savior, this is your day and hour. Just pray this prayer with me right now. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I come before your throne of grace and mercy this day, praising you for my salvation. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus, and save me right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Be blessed, folks, in all that you do.